Hey, Joshua. Joshua or Josh? What do you like going by? Uh, Joshua. Perfect. Okay. Joshua, what's going on, man? How how you doing today? Oh, I am. Uh, hold on, we just started just like that, didn't we? Sure. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> let's get let's roll. Let's do it. <laughs> hey, uh, how long do we shoot for? What's how long do you try to go? Uh, I would love to get you know about forty five minutes with you if okay. you're good. Um, well, I know a little bit about you, but not enough. So this, I'm excited to chat with you. So thanks for making time. I know you're a busy yeah. guy. No, my uh, my pleasure. Yeah, my first question is this, is what's the one thing that you do that you feel maybe that others don't that's been the biggest contributor to your financial success so far? Sure, I, I might, I, I probably define financial success different than uh, a lot of people. I'm, I'm, I'm not the type to define it like most of society does, which, which means more money equals more success. It's never been a, a thinking of mine. Uh, probably one one unique thinking that I have concerning money or one thing that I try to do as much as possible is I, um, especially today, but, but even before, uh, my goal has never been to, to make money um, in, in my work or in my business. I've, I've always strived to be as helpful to people as I possibly could, whether it was an employee or now running my own business. Um, how can I help as many people as possible? And I find that that the money seems to follow that mentality uh, more than the mentality of of just pursuing money and and trying to make more and more. So a little nuanced thinking. I get it. But how do you? Uh, that makes sense in terms of bringing the money in. But how do you hold on to it? How do you make sure you're, you're you know it stays with you? Um, sure. So I've, you know, I don't know how, how well you know my, my story, but, um, I, my, my wife and I started a, a minimalist lifestyle, uh, eight years ago, um, and have, have really rethought the, the role of possessions, <clears throat> uh, the, the promises of consumerism, um, how fulfilling they actually are into our life. Um, and have really, I think really kind of realigned our life, uh, away from, um, buying more and more things and and chasing bigger houses and nicer cars and um, a lot of things that, that other people are chasing and so be because of that realignment in our thinking um, it it naturally uh, had a significant profound impact on how we spent our money um, and so a lot I think I think a lot of the the trappings uh, or temptations that people have to outspend um, their earnings is just something that's slowly i think eroded from our from our thinking as much as we possibly can in in the world that we're living in got it so talk about uh before that point um back when you were a pastor i know you spent some time doing that uh was spending a problem for you at that point i know as a pastor you probably didn't make that much money i'm thinking uh so talk about uh, your spending and saving habits early on Sure. Um, you know, I, I've always been pretty close to the break-even point. I guess uh, growing up, um, uh, pretty middle-class lifestyle. It, if I were to do specifics, I think my first job um, when I was twenty, twenty-five or twenty-six, uh, my wife and I, my my first job, I think the beginning salary was like thirty thousand dollars. So that would have been fifteen years ago. So. I mean, not a lot, um, and slow, slow pay increases um, moving up from there. Um, uh, so that's that's always was kind of the, the financial position that we were in. Um, I grew up in a family that that was pretty uh, uh, pretty frugal, uh, not extremely frugal. Where we were, you know, patching every pair of jeans that we that we had growing up. But um, I certainly grew up in a in a home where I learned to to live within my live within my means, and so we um, we kind of kept that going forward. I got pretty good sound advice. I think pretty early on, uh, someone told me there's there's three reasons that people go into debt. Primarily, I said the three reasons people go into debt is they they buy too much house, um, they buy too nice of a car. Uh, or they eat out too often, or any any of those entertainment expenses, and that that's always kind of stuck with me. Uh, the first house that we bought was just a small three bedroom home that that we knew we could make the mortgage. I've I've never bought a new car in my entire life. Always uh, took the the cash that we had on hand and savings, and and bought the nicest car that we could find there. Uh, and then I, I think from my dad 
like just learned pretty early on that that eating out tends to tends to chew through money pretty quickly. So, um, um, you know, cutting those expenses when possible. Was there any other financial influence on you? Were you reading any books? Were you doing any courses? Where, where did you kind of pick up the financial expertise other than from the parents? Um, well, I, I have a degree in finance. Uh, that's what I that's what I went to school for. Uh, although I'm not sure I ever learned any personal, fi- I'm not sure I had any personal finance classes during my banking and finance degree. Um, so no, there there weren't any uh, there weren't any books that I was reading. I've seen some since then that have been. Uh, incredibly helpful. I, I think Dave Ramsey's program is um, probably the, uh, I, I always say, just the most effective program that I've ever seen for somebody who uh, who, con- who consistently outspends their their earnings. It's, it seems to have more staying power than any program that I've seen before. Um, but, uh, but no, there wasn't any particular influences in my life uh, at that time. Right. Sorry, sorry to not be helpful. <laughs> no, 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 that's good. Um, well, uh, let's go back to the turning point then, because it sounds like the minimalism turning point was a big, uh, in- impactful point in your life. And even though money may not be the focus, it probably had a uh, impact on your finances at that point. So, because I know you transitioned to do other things now. Um, so, so take us back to that moment to where uh, you decided to make a change in your life in terms of what stuff you had in your, in your house and, um, you know, the way you were just, I guess, treating your life in terms of the things the possessions in your life. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think that, uh, before eight years ago, eight and a half years ago, I guess by now, um, I, I pretty much describe my life as, as pretty unintentional in terms of what I was buying. And by that I meant whatever the new, uh, fashion trends were supposed to be, whatever the new technology was, whatever Best Buy had on sale for Black Friday, right? Like I, I was seeing the advertisements and flipping through the the, the Sunday paper and and just desiring whatever whatever I saw, uh, whatever they you know, were, were, were selling me on. Um, eight and a half years ago, I was cleaning out my garage on a on a Saturday morning and. Uh, my son was five at the time, and I, I spent hours working on my garage, just cleaning out a bunch of stuff that I, d- I didn't even know was there, I certainly didn't use, I certainly didn't need. And I think about early afternoon, um, just came the realization, what am, I, like, what am I doing with my life, spending all day taking care of the, the stuff that I own while my son plays alone in the backyard like like this is not what I want my life to be about I I I don't want to be a just a a stuff manager you know just accumulator of more and more uh, more and more things so that that began our process of of recognizing uh hey our our possessions aren't making us happy but they're actually taking away our money and time and energy and focus from from the things in life that actually matter um so that began the the shift that that started with simply just possessions um and simply downsizing the the stuff that we had which which then began to creep into how does this change my understanding of money and if if my money isn't just there to buy a bigger screen television then then what is my money here for? Uh, how can I use it in other ways? What are some more fulfilling ways that um, that I can use it? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, is there an area of your? Um, well, let's talk more about that transition. So, at the time, were you full time pastor? Uh, yep. Yep. Okay. And so, did mm. did uh, how long did it take before I guess that that point in your life to where you left uh, service in mm. the church? Yeah. Uh, so I literally that weekend, that's that following Monday, um, after the Saturday, I, I started a website. Um, it was for me, it was just a, uh, just a journal, just a diary of what I was getting rid of and what we were keeping and what room we were going through and what I was learning. Um, but it, it became a, a website that, that more and more people found and started reading and started commenting about how, how helpful this was to them and how it was challenging them to think through the life that they were living and, and what's most important to them. Um, and, and even though it was still just, just a hobby, uh, I always say about five years later, it, it got, it grew to the point where 
I, I couldn't do both. I, I couldn't both full-time pastor and, and maintain the, the website. Um, um, so I, I had to decide which one I was going to do. And I, I don't know, I was just finding so much. Um, I, I just found my, my passion was naturally creeping into how do I spread this message of minimalism and how do I get this message out that we're, we are more than the things that we own? Um, how do I do that better? Um, uh, and more effectively, and so that uh, that brought about the the change in careers. Then three and a half years ago, where um, I began writing and and speaking full time on on owning less. Gotcha. Which, by the way, uh, at some point you uh, you and your wife stumble upon. How when did that happen? Do you do you remember how it how it came about, or was it you or your wife that got interested in it first? Yeah, I feel like we uh, in terms of minimalism in general, or meeting you, or what? Yeah, yeah, either one. I, uh, my wife has always sort of been a, a minimalist, I feel like. We've both been pretty frugal people, but as our life has grown, three kids now, bigger house, the need for uh, being more consistent and applying it is is there, right? We can't just take a weekend uh, out of a year anymore to knock it all out and then be set for the year. It's more of an ongoing campaign, I feel like. And mm-hmm. so as our life has gotten more complicated, we've had to pay more attention to the messages of minimalism and, and your, what you're doing with your story. So, um, so yeah, we're, uh, we're certainly students and we're st- continuing to learn. And I think more or less learning how to create systems for minimalism now mm-hmm. than we are just about change of mindset. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Got it. <clears throat> But I feel like we, we bumped into each other in at WDS, World Domination Summit, back in, when was that, 2012, 2013, something like that? Yeah, boy, that sounds about right. And so you at the time, you were making the transition to full-timer, uh, full-time blogger, speaker. Did you do anything with your finances at that point, or had you done anything to help with that transition? Yeah, uh, considerably. Uh, we uh, we did a lot. Um, I, was, I was moving from a from a, a employee steady paycheck role into um into into running a business being an entrepreneur with who knows what was going to happen um so i did a i did a lot of research if if i were to do the i don't know how much i'll just go way into the details and yeah, yeah. you can you can go wherever you want to after that when i uh when i transitioned um into writing full time we sat down and and we mapped out what are our fixed expenses like what is the bare minimum that we need in order to get by uh and we came out to four thousand dollars a month i always say um we needed five thousand dollars a month if we wanted to keep our cell phones and go visit family for the holidays but four thousand a month was about what we needed for um for the mortgage and just for our, our ongoing expenses um on my on the blog, I was making pretty uh, consistently about two thousand dollars a month. So I was making two thousand. I needed four. I assumed once I went and invested full time into it that my income would go up. But uh, but that was the great unknown. Like who knows? Maybe 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 once I invest more time into it, I was gonna I was gonna lose everything. I I didn't know. Um, but what we did is I saved, uh, we had saved, um, $18,000 before I made the transition. And the thinking was, um, if I need four and I'm making two and I have a, a nest of 18 that at the very least I could go nine months, uh, without any changes in, um, uh, in the income that, that we were making, um, that would give me nine months to, find ways to, to make more money. So that was our, that was our thinking going in. Uh, it seemed to be, it seemed to be a good number. You know, it wasn't, uh, too little that, uh, that my, my wife was particularly nervous, but it wasn't so much. I've, I've heard other people who have made the transition and had like a year and a half in savings and just felt no urgency to make money in their, in their new job because they didn't have to. Um, but nine months I, I thought was going to be enough time to see, Hey, if it's not working after nine months, then it's probably not going to work long term. So that would give me time to uh, to go back to doing what I was doing before if I needed to. Gotcha. So the four thousand uh, that obviously covers, um, you know, like you said, your basic living expenses. 
was was there anything that your employer gave you like maybe health insurance or some other type of benefit that you had to also replace or maybe a retirement account that you had to replace somehow talk to us about those things and how you kind of weigh sure. that yeah uh health insurance was uh was something that that I got um through my employer that I had to factor into the four thousand a month so we uh, we did the homework on on what that was going to cost uh retirement was something that i um, I, I took as at that moment a um, uh, a want or unnecessary, so that wouldn't have been included in the four thousand. The four thousand I needed, you know, just to keep the roof over my head and and survive. Um, the uh, any income above that, then I would have been able to to chip into retirement. That I, I don't think that was factored in the five thousand number. Maybe maybe it was. So um, kind of had two different two different goals, but um, but we had been. So I was 30, mm, 37 at the time, uh, and we had been pretty consistent putting into retirement up, up until that age. Um, so it wasn't something that I, I thought I was behind on and, and needed to start at the age of 37. It was something that I thought, you know, hey, if, if, if I have to take a year break while I start this new job, I, I think that I can probably, um, probably manage long term with that. Were you contributing up to that point through uh, your church's 401k or how, what, what kind of plan is it? Um, yeah, I, gosh, uh, for a finance major, I should know the specifics. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> um, yes, I had been up through the, through the church. Our, our denomination had a, um, um, had a specific plan that, that, that people were going to, that people were using and, and it was being partly, partly matched. So I was putting it there. Okay, so there's an attractive match. I get it. So, was there any outside investing you were doing beyond that? No, no. Okay. So no. just just spending the excess money that you might have not, or well, maybe what were you doing with your excess money then, if you weren't investing it? Uh, well, just saving it. I, yeah, I'm just, just putting into a building up the the nine month gotcha. uh, buffer. Um, yeah. And did when you left the job, did you take that money and then put it into another investment, or do you still have it with the account? with the church. You still have it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Still where it was. Do you have any plans to move that or change that? Uh, I don't, uh, I don't, I should probably talk to you. You might have uh, some <laughs> ideas for me. <laughs> well, you know, no, I've, uh, I've, I've kept it where it was. Um, uh, as best I can tell, you know, it, the, the market's always pretty, you know, who knows what you're going to get pretty volatile for the past several years. But, uh, but I think I've been pretty, um, pretty happy and, and pretty content with, uh, with where it's going. So, yep. Yep. And where'd you end up on the health insurance? What do you, how, how'd you do that? Do a, just a open plan or are you now with Obamacare? Um, how does that work? Yeah. So three and a half years ago, um, uh, I, I forget if, if we were, I forget the Obamacare specifics at the time and, and how that was changing. Uh, but I found a, uh, I found a health insurance health insurance agent um, in our local community uh, who was self-employed and had two kids, and I said, "Whatever you got, I want," because <laughs> it was, it was the, like the exact same life circumstance. And I figured whatever whatever plan he signed up on was was probably the best one. So uh, we actually had a, a great deal. It was a great price, uh, and that was a it was a great deal through 2015. Um, and then going into 2016 was when we saw pretty significant uh, increases in the premiums for that for that open plan. It was off the market, um, and so at that point we switched to a medical sharing medical bill sharing. Uh, we're with um, Samaritan's Purse. Is that the uh, is that the name of the one? Uh, so uh, so we've been with that one over the course of 2016, which which works out pretty well. Um, it, uh, it's, it's less cost, um, it's it cost less than, than insurance would have on or off the market for us. Um, and I, you know, the, uh, I, I like it. I'm, I'm happy with it. We haven't had any major medical bills. So like you're happy with every health insurance if you don't have to use it. Um, I've, I've never had to, you know, be reimbursed through it. So, so then I would probably be able to say, yes, it was absolutely fantastic or, um, or I don't know, but so far for us, for our place in life, it's been, um, uh, it's been good. And I, I, I recommend it to, I think it's just a Christian only deal. Um, so I, I recommend it to other, um, Christians who are, who are looking for, um, uh, an alternative. Yeah. We do a similar thing through MediShare. 
So we've been on there for yeah. two and a half years, I think. Uh, it's been good. Yeah. But like you, luckily we haven't had uh, something major come up. So uh, when time, we first, time will tell. I, I don't know. I mean, information even two and a half, three and a half years ago is so irrelevant to, to health insurance today. But our to give you the specifics of what our health insurance agent set us up with, uh, he set us up with, a, at the time, it was a $10,000 deductible, uh, and, but a pretty inexpensive premium. And then we supplemented it with a $10,000 accident insurance plan, which was very inexpensive, $10 or $15 a month, something. It was, it was really cheap. And the whole idea being, um, you know, the, if there's a, a major medical emergency, then we have the health insurance. But we don't uh, sacrifice, you know, the, uh, my son breaks an arm while he's out riding a bike because the um, accident insurance would have covered that. So it was a pretty nifty a pretty nifty deal that, that we did that I, I recommended to other people. And that, like I said, it it wouldn't work for us now because premiums were, were through the roof, but it uh, might be an idea for people to consider. I had never heard of an accident um, policy before uh, before that time, but you, we uh, we started having it. Do you still have the accident plan? No. Or is your deductible no. so low now with the, the it doesn't matter? Um, I, you know, that's a good question. When, um, I guess I I never went back and like really reconsidered if 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 we should keep it or not when when we changed everything we we just switched over and um, I guess I haven't even what's uh, your what's your deductible what's your deductible now yeah that's a good question uh, you could probably pretty clip my wife would know better than I would what is the do you know what it is with you guys it's pretty similar yeah for us it's we, we're on we're on the uh, they have them from uh, I think twenty five hundred up to. 10,000. So we're on the 10,000 one just because yeah. we would rather have that cash set aside for medical spending. And I think every year we end up spending about 1500 to 2000 on pure out of pocket medical expenses. Yeah. Um, but I like the idea of the bridge insurance of, with a, uh, with an accident plan like that. So that's interesting. Um, who, who was it through? Who'd you buy it through? Do you remember? Yeah, you, no. uh, you got me. Okay. I, uh, I don't recall. <laughs> okay. Uh, we also, the, the church that I left, um, I moved from Vermont to Arizona several years ago and, and we, they, they contributed to a health savings account. Um, so we had a pretty, a pretty sizable health savings account that we had brought with us, um, that we also used and, and that we've contributed to every, um, every year, um, for some of that, to cover some of that, um, non-covered expenses. Nice. So with uh, Samaritan's Purse, you're able to continue contributing to the health savings account? Um, uh, or, we you, do. You haven't, I, you haven't yeah, had to do it this year? Correct. We haven't had to. Because I, 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 uh, I don't think you can do both. Uh, okay. Because it's not technically insurance. Got it. But I don't know about that particular plan, so that might yeah. be something to research. There you go. We'll find out. Because <laughs> we'll find out in the next yeah, six yeah, weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Once we moved to uh, MediShare, we were, we stopped being able to contribute because the HSA was huge for us. That was a I love that plan, but uh, we're actually still spending money from that that fund whenever we contributed back when I was in the corporate world. But uh, yeah, yep. Hopefully, new legislation may come out and may change the rules about HSAs and and so and, and MediShare communities uh, or medical sharing communities, and so that may change in the future with the new administration. It's, uh, so. It is it is just crazy. Yeah. Like you, I, I just have no idea. When I found uh, when I found this gentleman, uh, Bill Stefan is his name. Um, uh, we actually I went to a seminar, just a little local in your library seminar that he was putting on about. Uh, self-employed health insurance and how Obamacare was was changing all of that. Uh, and I didn't know what we, it was one of the biggest questions, switching from employed to self-employed. So I went to his seminar and I was just I was just fascinated at his well, two things. Number one, the the um, the detailed knowledge that that people need to know about the healthcare industry and healthcare insurance and then how much of it he knew. I had I had no idea how how detailed and how in the weeds you needed to get on some of that stuff. And so, I mean, anyone looking for anyone switching or anyone in the market for for health insurance, I I would say go find like go find someone who does that for a living and and knows Obamacare and what its uh, effects are. Uh, I should say the you know Affordable Care Act and and what its effects are on the market and where your state is going and who's coming in and who's leaving. 
um, because it's it's too much for any person to know that isn't following it closely. Yep, yep. Um, and we'll link up to him in the show notes for sure so people can check out that resource. Um, let's go back to the retirement. I want to explore that a little bit. How does your faith sort of inform your ideas about the idea of retirement and savings for retirement. Obviously you participated in your church's 401k and, and did the match and all. Uh, and how much of that was just because they gave you the match and how much of that is actually because you believe there's this point in time where you sort of want to rely on the money you've saved to then live the rest of your life. Do you, uh, do you know where I'm going with this? Have we talked before about my, about my whole thoughts on retirement? Are you, are you lead me somewhere? Do you have no idea what you're asking for? <laughs> I, ve- I, I kind of remember a little yeah. bit about this. I know you, yeah. you potentially have uh, an upcoming book maybe about this topic, yeah. but, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I would just love to explore that with you because as a Christian myself, <clears throat> um, uh, I'm, I'm challenged by every day what I read about finances and saving for my future versus what, you know, my faith and the Bible informs yeah. me. So I just yeah. want to hear your, your thoughts on that. Uh, my, my thoughts on retirement have been, have been shaped from, from two sources. Uh, number one, the, the Bible. And then number two, uh, my grandfather, uh, who, who's, a, who's a pastor. And, and so um, obviously his, uh, his faith and his beliefs are, are based on, on what he reads in Scripture as well. Um, but I, I, I think that I can, I think I can talk about it in in even non uh, non religious terms, um, for people who would find that helpful, I um, I take a, a pretty unique stance on retirement, um, where I think the whole idea is causing more stress and anxiety than it's actually relieving. Um, I I, th- I I don't take a view of work. A, a lot of people consider work. Like a like, work has become a four letter word in America, where the the goal of work seems to be make as much money as I can so I can get out of work as soon as possible. And when the goal of work is simply to get out of it, we lose all of the the fulfillment and the satisfaction that we receive from doing work. Uh, I was talking to. Um, I was talking to a lady just this summer. Um, she owns a restaurant. Uh, she said she's just relaying the story. She had hired this, I think, uh, 17 or 18 year old um, girl, um, and they had had this really busy day, uh, and they were closing up at night. And the the girl made a comment to her boss, the owner of the restaurant. Uh, she just said, "Man, what a busy day! I'm so tired." And the lady I was talking to, the owner of the restaurant, said yeah, doesn't it feel great? And it was just like this total mind shift in this, in this teenager's um, thinking of, yeah, you know what? It does feel good to know that I worked really hard today. And so I think work, the, the same thing, right? Like it's very fulfilling to know that we put in a hard day's work and that we've lived a life that um, where, where work isn't just about the paycheck, but the work is about like I'm helping other people. I'm doing something for someone uh, that they can't do because they're off doing something for someone that they can't do. And this is how we this is how we better society. Um, so anyway, to make a long answer even longer, this this whole idea then that that we would be spending our lives trying to get out of work seems uh, seems wrong to me. And I, I think that this. This whole idea of retirement, which is basically about a hundred-year-old experiment. I mean, they weren't retiring 200, 300 years ago. They were, they were working as long as they possibly could. Uh, it's only once we've reached this uh, this life of uh, leisure and this life of um, you know just material wealth that we have around us that we can even s- consider checking out of work at at some randomly randomly assigned age. And so I'm 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 not a big fan of retirement. Uh, uh, I think that's causing more more problems than than it should. Uh, I understand there are some jobs that you can't do into your 70s and 80s, and I understand that there are some physical limitations that uh, that keep us from working into our 70s and and 80s. Um, but for the most part, I, I think the the longer you can work and the longer you can use your mind to serve other people, um, the uh, the more fulfilling your life is going to be, and the less stressful it needs to be now of how much do I have to have and how can I get out of work and. Um, so anyway, that's a kind of a long road as far as how the, you know, how the Bible works into it. I, I think that 
you know, you, you, you almost find a biblical mandate that says that that will work from from dust to dust. I mean, we we work from from birth to death, um, and then um, um, you you don't find like retirement isn't isn't a, a thing in, in the Bible. You know, it's not a thing that that God's talking about and, and calling us to do with our lives. And then my grandfather's 93, uh, 90, scratch, I think he's 94, 95, and, and he still works 40 hours a week. And um, so just seeing his model of living that out um, and the fulfillment that he finds from work has really kind of changed my view of, of what everyone's what the new American dream of is, is early retirement. Yeah. yeah. Relate that to the idea of, uh, financial independence versus a retirement. Uh, so do you, well, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, and what I mean by financial independence is being at a point to where the money that you've saved or the assets that you've created or own, are producing enough wealth to where you don't necessarily have to go start and create wealth either through a job or another business or some other asset at that point. You believe that? Uh, go ahead. Uh, I am not a financial advisor. Um, I, I tend to be. I, I tend to prefer to to just raise questions and and raise new thoughts um, that go against what what kind of the the mainstream thinking is Um, and so i I take a little different view on on saving um, than than a lot of people do i uh, we should be saving and in terms of saving for retirement i i think it's wise for me to assume that uh, i won't necessarily be making the same amount of money in my 80s that that i make in my 40s and 50s so so there's a point of of saving for that and, and putting some some money aside, um, but I take the but I also take the uh, the the opposing view or the the different view that says the whole idea of saving is I am going to set aside money today for a potential need in the future that may or may not occur. Um, so if I'm setting aside for financial independence, if I'm setting aside for retirement, I don't know if I'm ever going to actually need that money. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. It's, it's an unknown. Um, but I'm setting aside money today for a potential need in the future, but I'm always doing it at the expense of someone's real need today, that there are people today who um, don't have enough food and, and they don't have a home and they, they need health care or they, uh, they need um, injustice or, or uh, you know, a weather catastrophe has you know, left, them, left them homeless. Um, and so there are people today with very real needs. And so I think the, the balance for me, and uh, I, I don't know, the, there's, there's no specific answer to this. The balance today is how much do I how much do I set aside for from how much money do I set aside for day for something that I may never need in the future, uh, knowing that there are people right down the street or certainly on the other side of the the ocean that that desperately need it today and um, kind of weighing those weighing those two factors as opposed to just buying into hey my goal is financial independence and so I'm going to save enough that I can live off the interest I'm like I I I don't know I I think that there's I think there's more ful- fulfilling ways and more important ways to uh, to use our money today. Yeah. yeah, and especially I think as you become an entrepreneur and your your paycheck becomes less stable and you have exponential growth with obviously with your business endeavors now. And so at the end of the year, you could have you could be sitting on, you know, a lot of cash, right? And so at that point you can decide does this go toward like you said, you know, my future uh, or does it go to a, to a need right now? So how do you how do you and your family kind of talk through that or work through mm-hmm. that each each season? Um, I would say for for now, my um, my my monthly income tends to be not uh, uh, too much more than I need. So probably my my reoccurring monthly income would be uh, around that five to six thousand dollars a month. Um, but then we've had about three times each year where there's been uh, a significant event that has brought in extra money. So I signed a book contract. Um, I, 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 I launch my uncluttered course, which 
does better or does worse than I expect. Um, and so it, that's, that seems to be above and beyond the, the normal um, stable income that we have. And so each time that has happened, my, my wife and I have sat down and, and said, okay, here's, here's how much unexpected money came in that is above and beyond what we need. Uh, where do we want to put it? What do we want to give it to? Where do we want to give it? Do we need to save some for? Um, do we need to save some for the business? Do we have a, a large expense coming up that we foresee? We'll need to replace our car in a couple of years, and so we're uh, even setting aside some of that money for that now. So, um, so that's what we've always done when because it's not like it's you know um, coming in 15 times a year where this would be a weird conversation to have. It's you know three or four times a year and. We're like, okay, what what do we think is the the thing for us to for us to do with it? Yep, yep. Yeah. So you see yourself, and I, and I don't, and I, and I don't have a, and I, I don't, I don't have a good, like I don't have a spreadsheet that I'm pulling out to to determine the where that conversation goes. It's just a, where are we now? Uh, what do we foresee in the future? What do you think would be smart and where should we put it? And so they're, they're, they're each a little bit organic and I, I have my opinions and she has her opinions. And so how do we, um, you know, how do we bring them together and, and find something that we can both agree on? You mentioned earlier having sort of an insurance agent help you out during a period of your life. Do you have, uh, any other type of financial services or advice that you pay that you pay on a regular basis, an accountant or? Uh, yeah, we have we have an accountant that I use um, for, uh, and and he's he's actually pretty good. He 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 does a lot. Um, he certainly does, you know, taxes and and helps me fill all that stuff out. But he's a he's a guy that that I that I really love, and we have we have very similar worldviews. Um, he knows what I'm, we, we started a nonprofit with some of the money that with actually the book money, we started a nonprofit. Um, and so he's like, he's been pretty influential in helping us, um, kind of navigate those waters and, and realize who we are and what we want to do with our money. And yet still what's, what's good advice compared to, you know, what, what our heart is with the money and it kind of helps us, um, bring those two together. So those are the, uh, those are the two. I I don't have um, someone that I pay for like investment um, advice. As I as I said, our our retirement account is um, um, kind of just running in the in the background, and we we trust the. It's not an individual, but we trust the company that seems to be running that and right. seems to be pretty good returns. So yeah, and and you mentioned that was still with the uh, the old church, the church. Yes. Do you anticipate right. starting up a new retirement account at some point on your own? <clears throat> Um, yeah, we will, uh, we have, we have money that, that, um, for, this is the first year of, of being self-employed where, um, where it looks like we'll, we'll have enough at the end of the year to, uh, to make a decision, um, decision about that. Um, I, I haven't, I haven't made the decision yet, yeah. but uh, talk, we'll do something with it. Talk to us about the nonprofit. What's what's it do? Uh, we started a nonprofit uh, a year ago, actually November first of, of last year, called the the Hope Effect. Um, our our heart is to to change orphan care around the world. Kind of the the short story is um, uh, most orphan care in third world countries looks like um, an orphanage that you would imagine on television or in books, right? Where you got four walls and thirty or forty kids and and a couple adults taking care of them. Um, but we've actually known for for decades. Research has told us for decades that 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 doesn't work very well for kids. Uh, that they don't get uh, attention and affection and and even love, interpersonal love that they would in a family when it's so many kids to just a few adults. And it uh, it tends to stunt their their human development in almost every uh, every single stage. Um, so our our heart is uh, we have a, a really a new model for for orphan care that. Um, that looks like um, smaller homes in a campus setting. Uh, each smaller home houses eight orphans and two adults. Uh, and in that way, it, it functions just like a family would, and it looks like a family. Uh, kids get attention and affection that they would in a family. They also see how a family functions for when they have families of their own. So uh, that's what we're doing with the, with the Hope Effect. We launched last November. Uh, we have a home being built in Honduras that should be done by the end of this year. 
Um, and now we're raising funds for um, um, for our first campus in uh, in Mexico, just just south of the uh, a border town. Uh, just um, which, by the way, the the Mexico U.S. borders in the news lately. So there's a <laughs> uh, there's a, a border town in uh, in Mexico where um, where we're going to be putting our, our first campus and, and should be able to start building in uh, 2017. That's fantastic, man. So yeah. um, it gives you a place, a specific place that uh, lines up with your values. That when you're thinking, when you have that end of year conversation. Um, not necessarily just about going to my church with my tithe, but also there's a specific thing that I'm passionate about that some of this money could go toward. I love that. Uh, uh, I would be remiss not to talk to you about how the minimalism has affected how you actually handle your money. So if you have some time left, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about that. Like where you bank, uh, do you use credit cards, you know, just sort of the, the, the daily transactional stuff of your money. You're a minimalist. So how do you keep, money, you know, in a minimum level in your life? Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm, uh, if I'm, if I'm outside normal on, on that. Uh, we have, uh, we have, a, a at our local bank, we have a, a checking account and a savings account. Um, both of my two children have, have a savings account. Um, we have, uh, I have three credit cards. Um, but one is the, the, the primary credit card, the only one we use, uh, one gets me into Costco. <laughs> so, uh, that's the second one, which we only use at Costco. And it's the only reason I suppose I should just combine them, but the Amex. Um, yeah. yeah. And then, uh, um, well, they just changed it from American express. So oh. I, that, that they're, uh, I don't, that's know, right. I, I, don't know, to... I don't know what there is now, but, yeah. um, it's in my wallet and I only pull it out when I don't know. I don't remember the last time I've been there. My wife goes, uh, and then, uh, and then I have a, a credit card for my business, okay. um, becoming minimalist. Uh, actually, I I don't do a lot of the financial stuff for the Hope Effect, but I, I guess there's a separate credit card for the Hope Effect um, as well. Um, and then, so both becoming minimalist and Hope Effect have um, have business accounts, and those are at the same bank that we have our uh, personal um, checking and and savings. Um, so that's how we that's how we do it. I uh, I we tend to run all of our expenses through our credit card um, and then pay it off at the at the end of the month. Um, I don't think I've ever missed uh, miss being a, able to pay off the entire balance at the at the end of the month. Um, so um, so we've always done it that way. Um, I've I've never done the the cash envelopes. I I think it's I think it's great for anybody who's whoever has or consistently misses making the you know making the the monthly payment. Um, but, um, but we've always been pretty good, I think, controlling our spending on the front end to, to make sure that we um, match up okay at the end of the month. Yeah. So do, do you do any type of budget or pre- preview look? Here's, here's the head of the month. Here's the month ahead. This is what we're going to plan to spend. Uh, what we, uh, what we do is a, a little bit, I don't know if it's a little bit different or not, but I, um, uh, I, I stumbled upon it, um, a couple years ago after doing the, uh, becoming minimalist thing. I stumbled on, uh, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, uh, uh, called a personal spending plan, which is probably just a difference of, of wording. Yeah. But um, but I loved it, and I, I never had a budget system that worked, but this spending plan worked wonderfully. And it what it does is you list out all of your fixed costs. So what is your mortgage? What is your health insurance? What's your car payment? What's your car insurance? Uh, your your utilities bill, the things you you can't get out of. So we wrote down um, all of our all of our fixed costs, and then um, it was compared to what your monthly income is. And so from there, you could you could discover what your discretionary income was. Uh, and then from there, you could decide, okay, I have this much money for entertainment. I have this much money for clothing. I have this much money for retirement, for savings, for giving. Um, and that that really, the first time we did it, um, I was shocked to discover uh, how little uh, discretionary income we had. I was shocked to see how close our fixed expenses were to our uh, monthly income. It was really eye-opening to see, hey, we really need to, you know, count how much how much is going um, uh, out there. 
Um, but uh, but since then, I think we made that adjustment pretty early on and uh, adjusted, downscaled our lifestyle to, to where it needed to be. Same thing when we made the switch three and a half years ago. Hey, here's the fixed cost. Here's what we're expecting our monthly income to be. So here's how much we have left um, to do these other things. Um, and that's something that we I, I've never done monthly. Um, but I, I, I don't know, yearly, I guess, or whenever I was expecting any significant changes in expenses or income just to kind of reevaluate and just get a, I don't know, just like a, a pretty, not just ballpark, but like a pretty concrete figure of, okay, here's how much we have to be wasting on things that we don't need. And do we have more or less than, than we think? Yep. Yep. And in terms of uh, those, some of those fixed items, you still have a mortgage, I'm assuming, and you have two cars, one car. What do you have? Um, yeah, we have uh, we have two cars, both um, all paid for. As That's I right. said, all the never all the bought it, never bought new. That's right. Ne- well, never, uh, yeah, never even had a payment, so never bought new and never carried a never carried a car payment. Uh, pretty good. Um, uh, car advice, I think someone was was pretty good. Said don't. You know, don't take a car payment, but instead, you know, save a car payment um, and put that aside. And then when you need the new car, buy the buy the nicest that you can with the money that you have. Um, and then whatever money you would have put into a car payment, just put that into a savings account for when that one doesn't drive anymore. You'll you'll have more saved up that you can buy a, a upgrade or a nicer car the, the next time around. So nice. And you have that, uh, is that a separate savings account or just, just the general <clears throat> savings account that you have at your local bank there? Yeah, just the, uh, just the general savings account. <clears throat> and, um, oh, I had a good question. Um, just lost it. I think it was about, uh, was it about the mortgage. No. Oh, any plans to pay off the mortgage sooner rather than later or? Uh, we, we just refinanced from a, a 30 year to 15 year. Um, no, I, I don't, uh, it's not something that is, a uh, I, I like, I want to ch- pay it off in a, in a couple of years. My, my wife would like me to actually, she makes the payments. I think she pays more than she's supposed to just for the sake of, of getting it down behind my back. But I, I guess the, um, <clears throat> kind of the, the financial piece of me says, gosh, if I have a 3.25% interest rate on my mortgage and I can make seven or eight percent investing it over here why would i uh, why would i why would i do that so that's kind of the thinking that that drives me but she tends to be a little more practical of uh, in terms of wanting to get out of the monthly payment so so she's the one that pushed to refinance it to a you know higher payment lower year and she's the one that kind of throws in a couple extra hundred dollars each each month that that i don't know about makes sense as as the minimal minimalism concept has because can you continue to kind of churn your life um and you've obviously freed up maybe more money for spending and now the business is bringing in more money how do you keep the mindset of uh you know frugality or just sort of living in a certain lifestyle because I, mean, I think at some point there's a there's a little bit of a creep that that comes upon you lifestyle creep so how do you keep that sort of at bay man it is uh it's it's tough you're uh you're right uh, i uh, probably one of the things that that helps me keep it at bay is we we moved from a when we we moved from Vermont to Arizona three years ago, um, and when we did we moved into a smaller house on on purpose, and I think having a a smaller house has has been very helpful in in keeping some of that creep from hey let's just go buy more and more things because we don't have any place to to put it and. Um, so, so that's been pretty helpful and I, I, I've never had the desire to let's go get a really big house or let's go buy brand new cars. So some of the, the major expenses I've, I've just avoided the temptation because it's never appealed to me. Um, the, uh, the, it's the smaller ones, you know, that, that tend to creep in and, um, um, Hey, we could, you know, we could re- replace this furniture or hey we can start spending more on on clothing than we did before and uh, i guess there's some of that where where minimalism allows us to to do that because i'm not buying a lot of clothes i can buy some nicer clothes so there's a a part of that that fits in there um but i i think mostly it's i i just kind of I, i work with this understanding that our our money is only as valuable as what we choose to spend it on um and if 
if I'm spending money on a big screen television, then then that's all I'm ever going to get out of my money. Uh, on the meantime, I I could be taking that money and I could be providing you know providing parents for for orphans, right? And that like the return on that is is infinite. Who knows what that's going to mean in the life of that child and uh, what they could accomplish in the world and who they're going to pass that on to. So that's kind of been the kind of the the background motto running through my head that I, I think keeps me aligned um, with uh, with what our values are. Yep. Just a couple more questions if you have time. Sure. Yeah. Uh, one is, is there an area of your personal finances and or is there one expense um, that just consistently gets out of hand uh, from month to month that you wish you could control better? Um, I think that the, um, uh, I I think eating out uh, tends to be one that that always drives me probably drives me more crazy than than the other members of my of my family which which make it tough to to keep in line i'm i'm always the guy let's just go home and and eat leftovers and they're the ones that wants to stop somewhere on on the way home and uh when you when you have the means to to do it then the temptation is even even more real uh so that's the one that uh not only tends to get out of hand but probably causes the extra strife in in my family um just between me I'm, I'm very much like my dad in that way he would he would never go out to eat if if he didn't need to um but my mom liked to so i always saw that um, that that uh would be not conflict is the word but just seeing that kind of go back and forth in my family growing up and uh, experiencing it now as well yeah, Teresa and I have that as well, and she's the one who's always trying to bring bring us home for leftovers. And thank goodness <laughs> I've got her because I would be eating out way too much. There you go. Um, so uh, let's look back over the past uh, several years, uh, maybe since since the transition from working at the church and um, some of the moves you've been able to make, some of the things you've been able to do financially as well as just life in general. You know, how do you feel? How do you feel about it all now? looking back uh, um looking back i, I <clears throat> uh looking back I, I i probably wouldn't change a thing um maybe maybe that's the way i would i would say it i i, I love i love that my first job was thirty thousand a year actually when i when i got married we were making twelve thousand dollars i was making twelve thousand dollars a year um and so i like i, I i'm I'm happy that that's how it went. I, I like being able to talk about how we went from um, when when my son was born and we went to a one income family that my income was like thirty two thousand dollars a year. I, I like being able to to tell people that's that's possible that that you can do it. Um, so I I won't change that. I I think that as much as I possibly can, going back to my opening answer i think my philosophy legitimately has been from the very beginning how how can i help how can i help the best uh, how can i serve people the best <clears throat> and when you do that then the the money seems to follow and i think that that's just a a, a more fulfilling way to to get to where i am today as opposed to knowing that i was i was chasing money at the expense of other people um, to know that I don't know the the road to to where I got is has been paved with people that I've helped along the way as opposed to um, people that I've stepped on uh, along the way. <laughs> well, I appreciate you being here and sharing that story with us, Joshua, or all your stories, um, and uh, and being generous with your time. So, how can folks uh, learn more about what you have going on and about you and your story? Yeah, uh, the website is becomingminimalist.com. Uh, that's the uh, that's the best place to go. The best place to to find me. All the uh, all the stuff that I'm working on seems to uh, originate there. Um, came out with a book in May <clears throat> called "The More of Less: Finding the Life You Want Under Everything You Own." Um, so if you don't want to flip through eight years worth of blog posts to to get to the point, um, I think that. Uh, that book tends to summarize everything I've learned over the last eight years. Um, gets into themes of intentionality and, and generosity in there as well. Um, and then the the book that I'm working on now is probably a year and a half till it comes out, but it'll be a little more um, financial specific on some of the views that we even talked about today. Thanks for letting me um, flush them out a little bit more. Absolutely, man. And for the nonprofit, folks can find that at 
Oh yeah, hopeeffect.com. Hopeeffect.com. And they can get, folks can contribute. Yeah, uh, we use the 100% model, so 100% of donations go directly to uh, orphan care. Um, as I mentioned, the the book deal that I signed has has funded the nonprofit, so we use that to um, carry all the administrative costs, um, so that all the donations that we receive receive from the public get to go directly into uh, construction or operation of of homes for homes for orphans. Awesome. All right, Joshua, I appreciate you being on, man. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for chatting. Appreciate you.